Okay, today we're going to do a lesson in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'll read verses 10 through 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. And I'll, I'll take the theme of the lesson out of verse 10. 1 Corinthians 1, 10. Notice what Paul says. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you for this day of grace. And we're thankful for your word and the opportunity we have to open it up and study. We pray that this time will uh, be a time of edification, that the gospel will be given clearly, and Lord, that the saints will be edified. And we just uh, thank you, Lord, for all the saints here, for the ones that listen on the internet. And we, we thank you, Lord, that we're just ambassadors for Christ, that we represent you, Lord Jesus. And we want to build up that doctrine in our inner man and be able to walk by faith and represent, represent you. And Lord, we're thankful for this opportunity today. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you look in 1 Corinthians 1 10, now I beseech you, brethren. Paul's writing to the brethren. The Corinthians were brethren. They were saved. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. There's a comma there. And that's what the lesson is today. Speak the same thing. And you'll notice uh, there's problems with this congregation. Paul writes a letter. And you'll find in verse 12, Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. So you've got the four names there. And I put Christ first here, then Cephas, and Paul, and Apollos. So we're going to be looking at those four names here in the lesson today. But if understand this about Paul. He's our apostle. He sets a standard for the local assembly and the body of Christ. And thinking about that, in verse 10 there, you'll look at the word same. That word in, in 1 Corinthians 1 10, the word same is used three times. The same thing. Notice it says the same mind and the same judgment. Three times it's mentioned there. And when you something is the same, it's not different. So you think about that way. And speak the same thing. Don't speak things that are different. That's what we're going to look at today. Here's an example, a Bible example. Turn back to uh, Psalm 133. And keep that in your mind about speak the same thing. Don't be different. Look in Psalm 133 and verse 1. Psalm 133 and verse 1. <clears throat> Turning over there to Psalm 133, 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now this is in time past. Uh, talking about brethren dwell together in unity there. But unity, you'd think about fellowship in that case like that. Well, when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul's talking more than fellowship. When you read 1 Corinthians 1 10 there, he, he, tells them, he tells them they speak the same thing. It says the same mind, the same judgment. So it's, it's more than fellowship there. The issue is doctrine. That's the issue. And whenever you think about doctrine, you're thinking about Bible teaching. You're thinking about there's doctrine throughout the Bible. But in this time period we're in, the dispensation of grace, Romans through Philemon, that's sound doctrine for us. There's doctrine in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But for us, sound doctrine is Romans through Philemon. So Paul's talking about doctrine there uh, when he talks about this. Uh, and the real unity comes in the doctrine. And, you know, if you don't know this, or if you need to renew your mind, turn back to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, 
you think about doctrine. I've often thought about people that make comments to me in, over the years, and one man in particular made a comment one day that our church, we don't like to teach doctrine. Mm -hmm. Well, you better like to teach it because I'm going to show you something. How are you saved? You're saved by the doctrine. Look in Romans 6, 17. Romans 6, 17, But God be thanked that ye were, look at the words past tense, you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart, there's your inner man, the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered you. You know, whenever you believe the gospel, that was doctrine. That's the form of doctrine. Well, what doctrine was that or is that? It's Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he was raised again. That's Bible doctrine. And that's so important. I mean, whenever you, you're first saved, you've got to hear sound doctrine. And sound doctrine is that Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he was raised again. So you think about that. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, though, you go back to that verse and you read a verse like this and you, you read in verse 10 uh, there about speaking the same thing. And you also, you, you think about the issues there. There's division. Notice it says in verse 10 there, 1 Corinthians 1, 10, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and there be no divisions among you. There shouldn't be any divisions among you. Paul is writing to them and, and making that clear to them. But yet, you think about what it, what it, what's the divisions all about? Is it a personality issue? And that can cause division. Personalities. Is it a personality? Or is it doctrinal issues? Well, in this case here, we know for sure it was doctrinal issues. That's a, that was a problem. That's why he had division. And we're going to see this. We're going to see doctrinal issues when we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and about Peter, Paul, and Apollos. There's doctrinal issues there, and that's what the division was about. When you read verse 12, now this is how I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul. Some of them said, I'm of Paul. And some of them said, no, I'm of Apollos. Some said, no, I'm of Christ. And some said, no, I'm of Cephas. They were divided. There was a division there with these believers. So, go back to Philippians chapter 1. This is advanced doctrine. Philippians chapter 1. And look at verse 27. Philippians 1, 27. Paul's writing to the Philippians, the church of Philippi, in 127, Philippians 127, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. You know, that's their, that's their conduct, their behavior. Let it, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So what does it mean, becometh? Well, it simply means this. Does your life attract people to the gospel of Christ? Your lifestyle. Does your life attract people to the gospel of Christ? In other words, every day we put our life on display. Every day somebody's looking at you. More than, more than just one person. There's people looking at you when you go out. So I'm on display when I go out. And you know who we represent? The Lord Jesus Christ. We're ambassadors for Him. Well, look here. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And look at verse 17. 1 Corinthians 11, 17. The church of Corinth, they were saved, but they were carnal. They were babes in Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 17. Paul says, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. That's a pretty bad testimony if they come together for the worse. And for the worse there, they come together for the wrong reason. Have you ever, your background in church, have you ever seen that happen? We all have. We've seen people that come together, they meet, and they do it for the wrong reason. Now look here in 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved 
may be made manifest among you. Well, that word approve there, another set, for there must be also heresies among you, that's bad teaching, that they which are approved, that's mature saints that are approved, may be made manifest among you, that's maturity, being approved. Well, how are, how are we approved today? 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, the only way we can be approved is by study, by rightly dividing the word of truth. And if we don't rightly divide it, we're not going to be approved. So, some of the, some of the Corinthians at Corinth, they had the message right. But there were some that did not have it right. And that's, that's a bad testimony. Uh, look at Ephesians for an example. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll start in verse 1. And this, this deals with our walk as a believer. Ephesians 4, 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you be worthy, that you walk worthy of the vocation with your call. Notice the word walk there. How should we walk? Worthy. And notice there how. Let's, let's add the word. You read the word. You read the verse. I therefore the prayers of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation with your call. Well the next question would be how am I supposed to walk? Verse 2. Look at this. With all lowliness and meekness with long suffering forbearing one another in love. Now that's saying a lot right there. How I, how I should walk as a believer. I should be, I walk with lowliness and meekness, power under control. I have myself under control with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. That's how you walk. Well, when you do that, why should we walk that way? <clears throat> well, look at verse 3. Here's the why. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit uh, in the bond of peace. You're endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Endeavoring. What's that? That's the unity. The unity of the Spirit. That's a doctrine listed in verses Ephesians 4, 4, 5, and 6. Look at verse 4. There is one body and one Spirit, even your calling, one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in, and in you all. That's the unity right there. Every believer in the body of Christ ought to have that unity. Every, every believer in the body of Christ ought to understand there's one body. There's one spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. And there's one hope. Well, what hope would that be? That's the blessed hope. That's our gathering when we meet the Lord in the air. And there's one Lord there. Not two. Not, notice that one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. You know, and you think about there's, uh, there's one Lord. You think about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you got one faith. And you got one baptism. And that's Holy Spirit baptism. That's all you've got. And so, every believer ought to have that, know that doctrine. And if they'd know that doctrine, there'd be more unity in the body of Christ. Now, you think about that. So, think about the Corinthians. You think about what happens though, before I say this, what happens if somebody do, doesn't maintain this doctrine here in Ephesians 4, 4, 5, and 6? What do you do with a person? And that one, for example, they believe there's more than one baptism. What do you do? Romans 16, 17. Look at this. Romans chapter 16. They're not my enemy, by the way, but the doctrine's not right. There's only one baptism, and that's Holy Spirit baptism. Well, you look at Romans chapter 16, and look at verse 17. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. That's what the Bible says. I mean, you think about somebody that teaches bad doctrine. What do you do with them? You sit there and listen to them? No, you don't. If somebody's preaching and teaching bad doctrine, what do you do? Mark them, which are they cause division and offense contrary to the doctrine that you have learned, and avoid them. You got to mark. 
If you mark somebody, you identify that person that's doing that. You know, I'll ask you this question about bad doctrine. Have you ever lost a friend over bad doctrine? And the answer is yes. For me, have you ever lost a friend uh, over bad doctrine? Well, let me ask you this. I hear all this all the time, and really, people will say, well, I've got a friend over here, and I've got one over here, and you get through talking to them, you've got friends all over the world. Well, I don't have that many friends. I've got acquaintances, but I don't have that many friends that like that. So what is a friend? Well, let the Bible tell you. Deuteronomy chapter 13. It's for our learning. You go to Deuteronomy 13, and you're going to find out what a friend is. I was talking the other day, you know, growing up, if you had a car, that was a big deal back in our day. Well, guess what? You had a lot of so-called friends, but they were only acquaintances. So you look at Deuteronomy 13, 6. What is a friend? In verse Deuteronomy 13, 6, If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, that thy nor thy friends. And you know the context here, isn't it? But he's talked about, no so friends there. It talks about, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul. Now that's what a friend is. He's, he or she is just like your own soul. Now you think highly of yourself, that's your inner man. And you think about that. And a real friend doesn't jump and get mad and jump and leave, but all of a sudden that's it. That's not a friend. I'm sorry. I'm really not sorry because the Word of God says, like it says there about a friend right there, uh, or my, thy friend which is as thine own soul. Now that's how close a friend is. That's what a friend is. It's like your own soul. And, you know, you, you think about marrying, uh, We've been married all these years, and she's more than a friend. She's my wife, Connie. You and I love her. And you, you think about those. She's in my soul. It's like my own soul. And just because you get mad over a disagreement, so I'm leaving. That's no real rhyme or reason to do that. But you think about even in assemblies, people that get mad and leave over things that over doctrine. And you know, there's a big thing about doctrine nowadays. There's a lot of doctrine being taught, but there's some of that doctrine is not sound doctrine. And that's what you have to learn to judge. <laughs> when you judge that, that's the sermon. You understand that. So I want to give you that about a friend. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and look at verse 11. So the Corinthians... They were saved, but they had problems. 1 Corinthians 1 11. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Ploy, that there are contentions among you. Notice that there are contentions among you. Why do we have contention? The Bible tells you, and you know the verse, Proverbs 13 10, only by pride come a contention. That's why you have it. Pride's what causes contention. Why does people fuss and quarrel and argue? Because of pride. So you ought to mark Proverbs 13, 10 down. Then you look at 1 Corinthians 1, 12. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Paulus, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Notice what, he, what Paul says there, that every one of you saith, well, if, you, if every one of them were saying that, they were throwing accusations toward each other, right? They were. They were accusing the other, I like Paul better than you. I like Christ better than you. I like Peter. I like Cephas. That's what they were doing, throwing those accusations. Instead of unity, there was no unity in that church of Corinth. There's division. Verse 13, 1 Corinthians 1, 13, 
Notice what Paul says. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now those three questions. Well, what's the issue? Who is the issue when you read verse 13? I mean, Christ is the issue for anybody. Doctrine, the purity, and how sound doctrine. The Christ will be the issue. So what we're going to do today, we're going to take 1 Corinthians 1.12 uh, with the names given. You've got the Lord Jesus, you've got Paul, you've got Paul, you've got Cephas, you've got Christ. And we're going to notice these four names, and we're going to look at them how they apply to today, because that's to us, and show it how it works today. So looking at the first one, we'll start out with Paul. And uh, notice there in verse uh, 12, 13, uh, uh, in verse, I'm sorry, verse 12, now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, so we'll start with him. There's some of them saying that I'm a, a Paul there. Well, they, they made Paul the issue, what they were doing. There was division, there was carnality, walking after the flesh. They made Paul the issue, not the doctrine Paul was preaching. See, they ought to made the doctrine that Paul was preaching the issue, and they didn't. They made Paul the person, the issue. And... You think about that in uh, his office. They thought about his office. Wow, he's an apostle. He's somebody that's important. They made that the issue more than the doctrine. And uh, not himself. Now look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. See, warn them. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, don't that remind you of a lot of people today? They get on the internet, social media, they've got 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. You know, who brought the gospel to them? Paul did you look at 1 Corinthians 4, 16, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Why should, why should they follow Paul? Well, he's our apostle. In verse 15 there, Though you have 10,000 instructions of Christ, yet have you not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you uh, through the gospel. You follow Paul in the gospel. And you know what's in the gospel? The doctrine. We just got through reading that. Romans 6, 17. What's the doctrine? Christ died for our sins, and he is buried and was raised again. When you believe that, that's when you're saved. That's sound doctrine. Paul understood something. Uh, you know, the only way that they could follow him was follow the doctrine. And that's the only way they could do it. But what were the Christians doing? They were worshiping man, like Paul. Some of them were trying to worship Paul. And the Christians, they had left the doctrine. That's what they'd left. So that's Paul. That's just a little summary of him. We're going to talk more about him. But you've got a pause, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, there, and look at verse 12. You read that. Now this I say that every one of you said, I am a Paul, and I am a Paul. Well, the question is, you've got a pause, and we're going to go back in the, tra in the transition book, the book of Acts, and learn a little bit about a pause. Turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. And Acts 18, and look at verse 24. We're going to learn, find out something about Apollos. Acts 18, 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos. So, all right off, we know he's a Jew. Born at Alexander. That's down in Egypt. An eloquent man. Well, if, if he was eloquent, he was a good speaker. He was a smooth speaker. He used correct language and, and all. And mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. So he is mighty in the scriptures. And people say, well, boy, that's the man we need. Well, read on. Verse 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being, being fervent, he wasn't lazy, in the spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. That'd be an issue right there because we're in but now time period, even in Acts 18, 
all the same next nine, the dispensation of grace started. So he only knew the only the baptism of John. Well, look here, verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expanded in him the way of God more perfectly. He had to learn. He was back before the cross. He believed that John's baptism. He, was, he, didn't, he didn't even know the Messiah had come. And all. So you think about all that. But this is the first time Apollos shows up. And he's preaching John's baptism. And that's all he knew when he preached that. In, eight, in Acts 18, 26, I read that. It mentions Aquila and Priscilla. Now that's something to be interested in because Aquila is the husband. Aquila, uh, Priscilla is the wife. Why is his name listed first here? When you read Acts 18, 26, you've got Aquila and Priscilla, and you've got the man mentioned first in this verse. Uh, and why is his name for, listed first? <clears throat> it's dealing with doctrine. That's why. You're going to read other passages about Aquila and Priscilla, and her name will be, be mentioned first, but it's not talking about doctrine. So here in this case, it's talking about doctrine, because all he knew is the baptism of John, and they expanded, expanded on him the way of God more perfectly in verse 26. So why, why would... Why would the Holy Spirit put the man first here? Because the husband is the head of the, the ha of the wife when it comes to doctrine. Bible doctrine. Man ought to be the head of the house when it comes to doctrine. And if a man's not, doesn't believe the doctrine, is not the head of the house about doctrine, he's not doing his job. So if Priscilla's listed first, that means the doctrine's not the issue. And you'll read over. Paul's letters that she's mentioned first where the doctrine wouldn't be the issue. So just remember that when you read that. So what did the Christians, what did the Corinthians like about Apollos? Well, do you know where he went to school? Where did Apollos go to school? Acts 18.24 And a certain Jew named Apollos born at Alexandria. He went to school there. There's a school there well known in that area. And there's some bad manuscripts came out of that place too in Alexandria. You, you ever heard of the Sinaiticus Vaticanus? The bad manuscripts. Uh, they come out of there. There's some bad doctrine. So Alexandria, the, the education center of the, of the world on that day. So what's that mean? What's that tell you about the Corinthians? Some of them liked him. Well, the Corinthians loved the professionalism. He is professional. You know, he did everything just exactly the way he'd been taught. And not only that, but he spoke well. He had his speech, was, he spoke well and all that. The Christians listened to the man. They watched him, not the doctor. That's what they did. Do you, you see that today? You sure do. I mean, you see people that's been to these schools. And I'm not against education. But they bend and they get up and speak. They're smooth as butter. There, there's somebody else that's smooth as butter that's coming out there in the future. You know who that is? Antichrist. Mm -hmm. You think about him, but you got people who are smooth talkers. Well, Apollos was like that. But 1 Corinthians chapter 2, go over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And look at verse 1. Paul's speaking now to the Corinthians. You think about this. Some of them like Apollos, some like Paul, some like Peter, some like the Lord Jesus Christ. So in 1 Corinthians 2, 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So there's a reason for that. Look at verse 2. 1 Corinthians 2, 2. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ, and him crucified. Well, what book would that be in? That'd be in the book of Romans. You know, the book of Romans was written, they, they had the doctrine, but they didn't have the doctrine in their soul like they should. Notice it says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So, 
the foundation is not laid in their soul like it should be. That doctrine, the cross work of Jesus Christ in Romans, they don't have it like they should. And uh, that's, why, that's why Paul is saying that. Now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And look at verse 10. 2 Corinthians 10.10. 10. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. You know, for his letters say, those, who says that about Paul's letters? The Corinthians. That's what they were saying. Some Corinthians, they just did not like Paul at all. That's what it amounted to. And look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians 11, 6. Notice what Paul said. 2 Corinthians 11, 6. But though I be rude in speech, Paul was simple. And Paul was basic. And he told them, said, But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. But ye have been truly made manifest, but we have been truly made manifest among you in all things. You know, you think some of them exalted, exalted Apollos over Paul. Why? Not because of the doctrine, but because of Apollos, how he looked, how he dressed, how he spoke. Paul, you know, he was just plain and he spoke and gave the word. So, I'm just giving you a little bit of it. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And you see this today. You see divisions in churches today for the very same thing. Uh, you look at the next one there is 1 Corinthians chapter 1 there and you talk about Cephas in verse 12. Well, who's Cephas? We all know that's Peter. Well, Peter's the head of the twelve apostles, right? That's, that's who he was, the head of the twelve. But he also had the message of circumcision, the gospel. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, and look at verse 7. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 7. In Galatians 2, 7, Paul says, But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, that's Paul, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. And we know the gospel of the circumcision, that's the kingdom gospel. It was committed to Peter. <clears throat> well, some of the Corinthians were thinking that Paul is just a continuation of the Acts 2 ministry. That's what some of them thought. You think about Acts 2. You think about the twelve apostles. And some of them are trying to say, well, he's just a continuation. Paul is a continuation. And that's false. He was not a continuation of the Acts 2 ministry. That's like somebody say, well, when do you think the body of Christ started? And some people, I've heard people say, well, between Acts 2 and Acts 9, nobody's really sure. Well, I'm sure because the Word of God tells us. It's Acts 9. So you, you see what I'm saying there. You know, they think that Paul got his message. Some of, some people were thinking Paul got the message from Peter. And that's why I read Galatians 2.7. There's two Gospels there in Galatians 2.7, and they're not the same. Peter had one, Paul had one. So, uh, and some people didn't follow the message of Paul. And here's an example of not following the message of Paul. I had a family member years ago told me this straight out. He said, I'd rather follow Peter than Paul. Now, as a family member. So I don't try to hide it and cover it up. If a family member does that, they do it. We're not perfect by any means. The Redmonds are not perfect. None of the rest of you are. None of us are. But to say that, that's doctrinally, that's bad doctrine. Now then, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Did Paul have to defend his apostleship with the Corinthians? And he did. Look here in 1 Corinthians 9 1. He asked the question Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? The answer is yes, yes, yes. It's all yes. 
And so Paul is defending his apostleship. Look at verse 2, 1 Corinthians 9, 9, 2. If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. Notice that, yet doubtless I am to you. Those that are following the doctrine. That's what he's talking about there. There's some that are following the doctrine. He said, if I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, the ones that are following the doctrine. I'm apostle to you. 1 Corinthians 9, 3 says, My answer to them that do examine me is this. Well, what were the, were the Corinthians asking Paul? Where did you go to school? That's one question. See, some of them like Apollos. Apollos told them where he went to school. And they were asking Paul, where did you go to school? Well, look at 2 Corinthians 13, 3. 2 Corinthians 13, 3. 2 Corinthians 13, 3. Notice what Paul says. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which of you is not weak, but is mighty in you. They were seeking proof that Christ was in them. Like I said, see, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, they wanted proof of who he was. Well, look at 2 Corinthians 11, 5. 2 Corinthians 11, 5. <clears throat> Notice that in 2 Corinthians 11, 5, For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostle. What do you think a whit means? It's small. He said, But for I, I suppose I was not a whit uh, behind the very chiefest apostles. He wasn't behind them. Look here. They hear, this will clear it up. 2 Corinthians 12, 11. 2 Corinthians 12, 11. Talking about being... Uh, behind the chiefest apostles. He wasn't behind Peter, James, and John, the chiefest apostles. But look at 2 Corinthians 12, 11. I am become a fool in glory, ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. He wasn't behind them. I thought that was interesting. And look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, about what Paul says about himself. Even when he writes 1st and 2nd Timothy toward the end of his life, you think people are still questioning his apostleship. 1st Timothy chapter 2, and look at verse 7. In 2 7, notice what Paul says. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Notice what he says. He's still defending himself. The what are people still questioning? His apostleship. Let me ask you this. Do people question Paul's apostleship today? Yes. On a daily basis. You give the gospel out, and you'll say, well, and somebody's saved, and they'll say, well, brother, I believe the gospel, I'm saved. Well, do you understand that Paul is your apostle? No, I don't understand that. And they don't want to understand it. They want to deny it. But let me tell you something. In the religious system today, people believe that Moses led the nation of Israel out of Egypt. Is that right? Well, what, what about Paul? He's our apostle. He's our, the apostle of the body of Christ, Gentile. He's our apostle. But yet they don't want to believe that. They believe the law, but they don't want to believe grace. So that's, that's, that's talking about Cephas. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And look, look, at the, at, look at Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 12. <clears throat> now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. So th this is the largest group today. You've got a division in the body of Christ. You'll, you'll find people say, well, I'm following Paul. Some will say, well, I'm following Peter. Some will, might even say I'm following Paul, but the largest group would say, well, I'm following the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, why would the Corinthians do that? Well, they go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's why. And what are some of the Christian, or Corinthians doing? Following Christ in His earthly ministry. That's what they were doing. And is it, is it, it shouldn't be a strange thing to you 
to realize that why so many people want to follow Christ today in his earthly ministry. The Corinthians did the same thing. They were divided. There was a division. And there were so many who wanted to go back in his earthly ministry and follow him that way. Well, I'll say this. I can read my Bible and turn to Romans 15 and verse 8. I'll just let the Bible speak for itself. Romans 15, 8. And notice what it says. Romans 15, 8. When Jesus Christ came in His earthly ministry, notice who He was a minister to all. In Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made by the Father. Well, who would be the circumcision? That's Israel. That's who He ministered to in His earthly ministry. The gospel of the circumcision was given to Peter. We read that in Galatians 2, 7. Well, look here what about Paul. He's our apostle, Romans 15, 16. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Notice that. Ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. No, there's a difference there. Jesus Christ ministered to the circumcision. Paul ministered to the Gentiles. Well, look at this. Look at Romans 16, 25. Romans 16, 25. 16, 25. Now to him there's a power to establish you according to my gospel. That my gospel is Romans, the cross work of Jesus Christ. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. There's Ephesians. And so you think about that there. You think about what we've got. We've got the Paul's my gospel. It was given to him. And you think about uh, Paul's, uh, he's a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. So, look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And look at verse 16. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. In 2 Corinthians 5, 16, notice what Paul says. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, they, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Notice that. Uh, wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Why? Why do we know no man after the flesh? What would be the answer? 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. That's the answer. And Christ's earthly ministry, I don't, like Paul said there in verse 16, we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we Him no more. We don't, we don't know Him after His earthly ministry. He's up in heaven sitting at the right hand of the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ re revealed to Paul, gave Him the mystery to give to us, and we're following the Apostle Paul because the Lord Jesus Christ gave it to him for us to follow. So, but man, we're walking by faith, not by sight. So, you think about knowing Christ after the flesh, that was his earthly ministry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, 2 Corinthians 5, 16, when you see the words, yet now, read the verse. 2 Corinthians 5, 16, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, see the phrase there, yet now, that's but, think about but now. You think about uh, yet now, henceforth know we him no more. Why? It's a but now program. We're in the dispensation of grace. We're heavenly people. We're not earthly. That's why we don't know him after the flesh. And you know, the Corinthians, they were enjoying following his earthly ministry. And that was not sound doctrine. It was doctrine, Bible doctrine, wasn't sound doctrine. Because we're in the dispensation of grace, we're in a different time period. So, what do you see today? You see the same thing when you look at 1 Corinthians 1 over there and you go back to the verse. You see it today. You, you see divisions and 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at this verse here. Uh, in verse, verse, 12, verse 12, now let's just say that every one of you saith, I am a Paul, and I was Paulus, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. You see divisions like this today. And it shouldn't be. There should be unity. Ephesians chapter 4 over there we've gone over. 
And uh, I say this, it's very important that we speak the same thing. And the same thing is sound doctrine. Romans 2, 5, and rightly divide the word of truth. As a local assembly, as believers out on the internet, speak the same thing. You, you're, you believe the gospel of grace, you're saved with grace, you live with grace. Speak the same thing. Build that the house of doctrine up in you. Romans 2, 5, 11. And Paul sets a standard for us. And all we can do today is praise the Lord for who we are in Christ.